I want to introduce you next to one of those fabulous experienced physicians who's also a miracle worker and has probably created little minor miracles or maybe major miracles for some of you in this room. Um, that's Dr. Maxine barish Reedon. Um, <laughs> she is the uh, medical director um, at the Institute for Health and Healing here in Sacramento. She's board certified in internal medicine and earned her medical degree from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine and completed her internship and residency at UC Davis Medical Center. She's a graduate of the University of Arizona Fellowship in Integrative Medicine as well, uh, working under the, uh, studying under um, Dr. Andrew Weil. And Dr. Barish is also certified by the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine. She, um, for those of you who don't know Dr. Barish, I think she has this uh, rare combination of kindness mixed with this profound curiosity about um, the human body and medicine and how it affects us um, from a very holistic perspective. Um, she can do the entire range, as Judith said, from, from genetics to God. Um, and um, I like that. I hadn't heard you say that before. <laughs> and, um, and she's also an incredibly gifted diagnostician and practitioner. Um, I met her for the first time a little over a year ago, and it's been my vast pleasure ever since to work with her more, more closely. So uh, please welcome Dr. Barish. How many of you have heard of the imposter syndrome? Where people say all these amazing things about you and you feel like you're a total imposter? It's very common amongst medical professionals. So anyway, thank you very much for that amazing um, welcome. And my brain was going off going. <laughs> Anyway, um, I've been with Sutter for close to 25 years, and um, I know a number of you here in the audience, and, um, it, and I'll try not to cry during this presentation. Um, it's, it's been an incredible journey, and I, I'm very, very grateful for the work that, um, that I've done with Judith and Bill Stewart uh, and her team, and I just want to acknowledge the team that it took to put this together. Um, Finola Fitzclarence and uh, um, Antonio Fisher, who was my amazing office manager, and Ladan and Bobby, the people who've been out at the, uh, the, the, book, um, the book table. So it's been an incredible journey. I also want you to know, um, about two years ago, we started the process of really trying to expand what we're doing here in Sacramento. And last week, we moved into our brand new clinic in the Fort Sutter building Woo! next door. And uh, anyway, so we've had a lot going on. It's been a very, very busy time, but um, it's very exciting and, and we're just overwhelmed with all of the support that, um, that we've gotten here. So um, how did we end up here? How did I end up here? Um, just to give you a little background and, uh, and I'm gonna try not to talk too much. Um, I left college in 1976 because I felt directionless. My father had just died of cancer um, I started reading stuff about personality and cancer um, and uh, stress, mind-body medicine, that kind of stuff. And I, I, I got invited to go to India with a friend of mine in college whose father was um, the science counselor at the embassy in New Delhi, India. And my life transformed there. I, I got exposed to, uh, to meditation and yoga and amazing healthy food. Even though, you know, yes, there's a lot of poverty in India, a lot of challenges in India, it was an extraordinary experience for me. I spent two weeks with BKS Iyengar. Anyone know Iyengar yoga? I had no idea who Iyengar was. Uh, and I end up spending with four people with Iyengar every morning, four hours a day for two weeks. And let me tell you, I got challenged with what I could or couldn't do. So. Um, I came back to school and I changed my major to nutrition and I had an amazing professor, an amazing mentor and I ended up deciding that I wanted to go to medical school because I was going to change the world because I was going to teach people about nutrition and this was in the 1970s when at the Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, which is why I interned at the NIH, that we didn't believe that diet, you know, that the mantra was diet has nothing to do 
with heart disease. It's irreversible. Only my boss left to go work for Nathan Pritikin in Santa Monica <laughs> and came back several months later. And Pritikin was considered the enemy. And Nathan Pritikin was really a pioneer, one of those people who really started to challenge what was possible in terms of healing at a time when no one believed it. So my boss came back and, and talked about people going there for a month and being exposed to healthy food and exercise and stress management and getting off their drugs for diabetes and high blood pressure. And this was at a time when there weren't a lot of drugs available for diabetes and high blood pressure. So um, it was an extraordinary time. And so this has been a long journey coming here. Going through medical training, you can get this beaten out of you really easily because the focus is on treating the disease that's already there and then sending people back home. So anyway, I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've had for the learning and the training and the team, meeting people in San Francisco 20 years ago, and it's taken us this long to get here. So anyway, we're going to be focusing on um, paleo approach to health tonight. This is just a disclaimer. I am a Sutter Medical Group physician, part of the Sutter Medical Foundation. Um, and the Institute for Health and Healing is part of the Sutter Medical Foundation. We were just asked to put this disclaimer on. So three key points. We're going to talk about what is a microbiome and then what disrupts our microbiome and how do we start to heal some of that. And then Akil and Diane are really going to take that forward and help. So what is the microbiome? It's a bunch of bugs. But seriously, it's defined as all of the genes of the microbes that live in and on us human beings. And they're currently felt to be up to 1,000, perhaps even up to 10,000 different species of microbes in the gut. And it's like Star Trek, only we're going through the gut now. We're, we're seeing things we've never seen before, identifying organisms we've never seen before. And the genes in the microbiome, on the skin, the mouth, the GI tract, three to 10 million genes, and they outnumber the number of genes that we have on our body by at least 100 to one. So we're a super bug, we're a super organism. So in 2007, the National Institutes of Health decided to study that. After we had mapped the human genome, they started the Human Microbiome Project to try to identify what's in the gut. And this is a map that they've started to look at. Um, on the bottom here is different uh, colors showing stool, mouth, plaque, like on your teeth, you know when you get cavities? That's part of your microbiome. Your tongue, your nose, the vaginal area, the skin. So we're just starting to map all of these organisms that live on and in us. And most of the bugs don't cause disease. In fact, we need them. We are, that's what we're realizing, that they are an important part of our health and they help us to um, digest our food and sometimes produce nutrients like vitamin K. Um, they help to metabolize drugs that we take. They stimulate renewal of cells in the gut and they activate and support the immune system. Really important. But when we disrupt that, it's, it's an ecosystem. When we disrupt it, we get into trouble. So establishing what constitutes a healthy microbiome is a mystery that we are just beginning to unravel now in science. But we think that biodiversity, having a lot of diversity, really gives us good health. It's the richness and abundance of the bugs that live in our gut. So we have to ask ourselves, does your microbiome look more like a rainforest with lots of bugs and other animals? Or is it more like a desert? And some of us have deserts. And where does it all begin? It really begins in utero. It's really fascinating. We, we used to think that what was present in the mother's, um, you know, the, the amniotic fluid, the placenta was sterile. And we're finding, no, that's actually not true. There are organisms that live there, and that's what starts to populate the baby's GI tract and, and the organisms that grow on the baby's skin. And so the other things that make a difference is whether or not we are having a, a vaginal delivery. Uh, and the other thing is breastfeeding. Because when a baby is born vaginally, as it passes through the mother's canal, it is exposed to all of the bacteria there. And that is what starts to populate the gut of the baby. So it's a very different population of organisms we see if the baby is born vaginally versus C-section. And then breastfeeding is also 
highly important, and there's even data now, it's fascinating to show that the organisms in the mother's GI tract sometimes get picked up by the cells and transported in the blood to the breast milk and come out of the breast milk for the baby, again, to help keep the, uh, the, the, the baby's gut healthy. C-section rates around 50 years ago were about 5% or so. In the United States now, it's over 30%. In some parts of the world, Brazil is one of them, it's up to 80%. 80% of mothers are having C-sections. Guess who has the most C-sections? Moms with private insurance. Why? Because it's a surgical procedure. It makes more money. So what, ha what do we do to disrupt the microbiome? What starts that process? So again, just to give you a little idea, we're talking about really starting in the mouth, the health of the mouth, going down the esophagus into the stomach, and then into the small intestine, which is the blue and the green there, and the small intestine is where most of the digestion and absorption takes place. And then we go into that large pink tube, which is the large intestine or the colon. So there are organisms that live throughout the GI tract and different organisms predominate in different areas. So what disrupts a healthy gut? So we talked about if the mom's health is not good when she's pregnant, um, if she's had a C-section, has an impact on the baby, if she bottle feeds instead of breast feeds, and then from childhood onward, we're a, an incredibly clean society. Everything is sanitized. And that's probably not a good idea for the GI tract. So kids who grow up on farms and are exposed to animals and soil and all those, again, all those exposures help to keep the gut healthy. But we tend not to do that now. And we're using hand sanitizers everywhere. We're, we're really overly cleanly. And then antibiotic overuse, both taking pills and also getting exposed to antibiotics in the animal products that we eat. 70 to 80% of antibiotics produced in the United States are used in uh, raising animals. Why? Because antibiotics make animals gain weight. They make animals get fat. Why? Probably because it's wiping out their gut microbiome. And then certain medications will have an impact, like chemotherapy or acid blocking medicines. And then nutrition, highly important. Our diet has changed radically, radically since the turn of last century with industrial revolution, but really over the past 50 years since, or 70 years since World War II, we have a highly processed diet. We're not eating the, the, uh, the whole foods that we used to. We don't cook and eat at home the way we used to. So we're eating a lot of processed stuff and we're, uh, we're also not getting the vegetables and fruit and the the grains and the probiotic, prebiotic foods. We'll talk, talk about that a little bit more. And then artificial sweeteners. I encourage all of you, if you're using artificial sweeteners, stop. There's now data that they actually disrupt the gut microbiome and they increase the risk of obesity and diabetes and other inflammatory disorders. They are not good for us. So what else? If we have infections, you know, if you travel and you get traveler's diarrhea, it can really disrupt the microbiome. Stress. Stress has a big impact on how healthy we are and how healthy the gut is. Sleep deprivation or jet lag. They're finding out people are jet lag. There are changes that take place in the gut microbiome and it takes time to adjust that. Lack of exercise, exposure to environmental toxins. There's some concern that Roundup, glyphosate, is a GI toxin that may be you know, also contributing to illness. So um, what happens when the, when the microbiome is disrupted? We may not be able to produce the nutrients that those healthy organisms normally do. It may have an impact on our pancreatic function, and the pancreas produces enzymes to help us digest food. In addition to producing insulin, it helps us with digestion. We may develop dysbiosis, or IBS, or SIBO. I'll talk about those a little bit more in just a minute. And we may get inflammation and gut permeability, or leaky gut, we call it, and that activates the immune system. Okay, so we'll go into those a little bit more. So dysbiosis is a term that we use to describe just unhealthy changes in, in the gut. You don't have a normal, healthy rainforest. Um, and it occurs when the natural flora is out of balance, like if we're stressed or we're taking antibiotics. And then SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and sometimes now called small intestinal microbial overgrowth, because it's not just bacteria, it's viruses and parasites and fungi. We have a whole, a whole um, host of multiple organisms that live in and on us. 
But SIBO is when bacteria that normally live in the colon migrate upstream. They may do that because we're stressed or we're not sleeping or we've taken antibiotics. Um, and when that happens, those bacteria that move up where they're not supposed to be can cause a lot of physical symptoms. They can interfere with the production of vitamins and absorption. They also can start to ferment carbohydrates that are not supposed to be fermented in the small intestine. And so we can get gas and bloating and constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain. So it's felt now that many people, probably the majority of people with irritable bowel syndrome, how many of you know irritable bowel syndrome, what I'm talking about, very common term, but, um, but probably most people with irritable bowel syndrome have SIBO or SIMO. And the symptoms are abdominal pain and discomfort, bloating, gas, belching, and people can have either diarrhea or constipation. Either way, depending on the kinds of bacteria that happen to be thriving in your gut. So you may look like this guy after you have that nice big bowl of pasta <laughs> or your applesauce or whatever. There are some foods that are more likely to do this than others. So what are some risk factors? Again, all this stuff kind of keeps coming back to the same, same thing, low stomach acid. You know, I have so many patients who come in and they've been on Prilosec for 10 years, 20 years. They're, why? Because when they stop taking it, they get symptoms again. Well, that's how those drugs work. When you stop taking them, you get this rebound acid, and then guess what? You want to start taking them again, and the drug companies are very happy about that because you keep taking their drugs or if you've had lots of antibiotics. It can sometimes take a year or more for your gut to recover from a single course of antibiotics. Clindamycin is one drug. Flagyl is another one. So when we're taking a lot of courses of antibiotics, it affects the gut. If we don't have enough pancreatic enzymes, if we've had bowel surgery, diabetes. Diabetes is often associated with this abnormal pattern of bacterial growth in the gut. If you've got a bowel motility disorder, your bowel's not working well. Moderate or heavy consumption of alcohol also changes gut, uh, gut bacteria. And then multiple meals and snacks during the day. I tell my patients, eat two or three meals a day, try not to snack, because when we're not eating, that's when the small intestine actually works best. It's when it contracts best and it's when it clears itself out. And then how about leaky gut? We call that gut permeability or leaky gut, and it means the loss of tight connections in the cells of the gut, because there's a barrier there. And actually, we don't just talk about leaky gut now, we talk about leaky brain, dementia, cognitive issues, leaky kidney, leaky gut. Um, so all of the organs in the body that have these membranes that separate, you know, have, have a separation, we're finding that there may be actually leaky changes in a number of those membranes, not just the gut. So once this happens, if, if we've eaten something and we haven't fully digested it, if that gut barrier is leaky, we will be absorbing things that we shouldn't be absorbing, and then the immune cells can become activated. So this is just a little diagram. See, on the left are the tight junctions, those normal tight junctions. But if those break apart there and there's leaky stuff, these undigested food particles can pass through. And then right down here are the immune cells, blood vessels, and lymphatics. So we start this inflammatory process here. So what causes this for a lot of people? Gluten. Gluten is a hot topic. I, I, you know, it seems like 90% of people now think they are gluten sensitive or avoiding gluten, and the gluten-free industry is huge. Um, it, it, gluten, you know, certain whole grain products are good for the gut, actually. They help gut bacteria, but for a lot of people, gluten is an issue, and gluten does tend to break apart those tight junctions. If we have infections or harmful bacteria, that can lead to gut permeability. If we don't have that biodiversity, those organisms keep themselves in check there, and they help to keep everything in balance. Salt, sugar, and alcohol, excessive salt, we think can cause changes in gut permeability environmental toxins, drugs, stress. So there's a lot of things that we think are converging to create these changes. And then once that happens and you start that inflammatory process, remember most of the immune system, 70% of the immune system lies right outside that, that gut barrier. And so when that gets activated and you have all of these inflammatory molecules created and then antibodies get created, we can end up with inflammatory bowel disease, other autoimmune diseases, allergies, asthma, acne, 
obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, we're considering all of these, many of the chronic illnesses that we deal with now in primary care, probably related to what's going on at the gut level. So how do we heal the gut? So I just want to touch for a second about functional medicine. Um, so integrative medicine, like Judith and Susie talked about, it, it is all of it. What, what do we need to get well? As one very well-known teacher once said, if I'm in a car accident and my nose gets ripped off, I don't want to have to meditate it back in place, right? <laughs> There's a time and a place for Western medicine. But we have forgotten about our own self-healing capacity. Um, so functional medicine and integrative medicine are, are sometimes referred to as upstream medicine. We're trying to understand why someone became ill in the first place, rather than, oh, you're having heartburn, here's Prilosec, take this, it'll make, why are you having heartburn? What's going on in your life? What are you eating? What's your stress level? Are you sleeping? Are you exercising? Who are you hanging out with? Do you have a pet? We don't ask those questions, right? <laughs> I've seen this in my own family, you know, with my mom just being drugged by a psychiatrist, you know, and like, did you, did you say to her, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sure that you exercise five days a week and then I'll see you in a month and we'll see how you're feeling if, once you get out of bed. We don't ask those questions a lot. So that's what we try to do in functional medicine, to address the whole person, not just the symptoms. So we try to look at interactions, genetic stuff which is overwhelming, but gonna be really change what we're doing and really, really um, just fascinating. So we're gonna, we're gonna know what meds work well or what supplements work well for people, but exploding area of science, environment, lifestyle, we're gonna really start to look at the big picture. So Hippocrates, the father of medicine said, all disease begins in the gut. And that's starting to make sense to us, right? Remember, disruption of gut health, we think causes these downstream effects. So in a functional medicine approach, we start by going upstream, and we look at gut health. So in the functional medicine approach, there are different ways of looking at it, but one is the 5R. Some people say 4R, some people say 10R, but 5R. So remove, replace, re-inoculate, repair, and rebalance. So remove, we want to remove irritants. Are you on chronic acid blocking meds? Not good for your digestion or your overall gut health. Can we wean you off those? Do you have some occult infections in the gut? Are you eating too much processed food? Are you eating artificial sweeteners like we talked about? Food triggers, gluten and dairy, FODMAP foods. These are foods that are high in certain carbohydrates that get fermented in the gut and they can cause a lot of bloating and distress. So we wanna ban the junk food and, uh, or not, this is the, the this is the, the junk food, food pyramid. The USDA just came out with a new food pyramid, right? And what, what have they said? Well, we're okay if we're eating, I think it's up to 10% sugar. Guess who helped to write those guidelines? The food industry, right? Is, should we be eating 10% of our calories as sugar? Go, go figure, right? So we want to replace, and what are we replacing? We may um, use bitters. Bitters are things that, that my parents used to put bitters in their cocktails, you know, in the 1950s. Bitters help to get digestion going. Our vegetables, um, dark green leafy vegetables are bitters. Uh, vegetables used to be a lot more bitter than they are now. We bred the bitterness out of them, but bitters can help stimulate digestion. We'll sometimes use enzymes. Raw dairy is making a big comeback. We're realizing, you know what? Raw dairy is not gonna kill you. If you're getting chemotherapy and you're immune suppressed, don't eat raw dairy, but raw dairy is rich in enzymes. Again, some people just, their GI symptoms improve significantly when they eat raw dairy. Or if you properly prepare your food, your beans, nuts, and grains, you soak them, you activate enzymes in those foods. And we're replacing them with vegetables and you know the drill, right? It's what your mother told you, eat your vegetables. And this is Dr. Terry Walls at the University of Iowa. She is one of my heroes and she has recovered from multiple sclerosis. She was wheelchair bound. I got to meet her and hug her in November. And she really has taken a functional medicine approach to see what is missing in my body, the replacement of which is gonna help me recover. And so anyway, she's, she's a pioneer in leading us to see that we can reverse a lot of these chronic illnesses that we often say are irreversible. Or not, eat whatever you want, nobody listens to us anyway. <laughs> 
So then re-inoculate. Re-inoculate means we're, we're adding back in good bugs, prebiotics, probiotics. And probiotics are, are uh, foods that are rich in probiotic organisms. We'll talk about those in a sec. Uh, sometimes it includes pills, but be wary of pills, right? I don't think it's a good idea to be taking a probiotic over and over and over and taking those same strains, right? Because remember we said there's what, a thousand, maybe 10,000 strains? We're just starting to discover them. But nature knows what to do. If we eat the right foods, our bodies learn how to make the probiotics that they need. And then prebiotics are foods that have fiber in them because healthy gut bugs love the fiber. That's what they feed on. That's their food supply. And symbiotics are supplements that have both. So fermented foods like sauerkraut, cabbage. So um, every culture in the world had fermented foods. It's how we preserved foods in the past. So kefir, some yogurts, not all are rich in probiotics, but some yogurts are buttermilk. So cultured dairy products, sauerkraut, and other lacto-fermented vegetables. Lacto-fermented means it's salt and water with the vegetable, no vinegar. It's not that vinegar is bad, it's just vinegar, pickles, vinegar sauerkraut is not a lacto-fermented food. It won't give you the same benefit, so read the label. And then in Japan, tempeh, miso, and natto are fermented soy products. Kimchi, kombucha, kvass, how many of you drink kombucha? Kombucha is everywhere now, right? You can get it at the gas station, I think. Um, <laughs> Even sourdough bread, a good sourdough bread, which is sourdough starter, no yeast, sourdough bread. There are many cultures that that's one of the ways they got their fermented food. And even fermented fish and meats, okay? We just had um, St. Patrick's Day, and um, a lot of the, the meat served at St. Patty's Day um, are fermented meats. And then we want to repair. How do we repair the gut? So this is sometimes, again, where I will use supplements, uh, amino acids like glutamine and glycine, um, Glycine is found in bone broth. Bone broth is making a comeback. Bone broth is when you cook bones for a long period of time and the collagen and the glycine and all those things go into the soup and we eat those. That's how traditional peoples got their glucosamine. They didn't take a pill. They made their bone broth. Then minerals like zinc and magnesium, demulsants, which are things that coat the esophagus. So DGL is one supplement we use for that. It's, it's a form of licorice. Slippery elm, aloe vera, a lot of people use aloe vera. Again, it can really soothe the gut. And then we'll use antioxidants or anti-inflammatories like turmeric, licorice, dark berries. There was a study done recently fascinating looking at people with lupus with, protein, with, with kidney dysfunction, which is serious, right? They gave them a quarter teaspoon of turmeric, the whole spice, three times a day with every meal marked reduction in their kidney disease. Pretty incredible, right? Just nothing but the whole spice. Very protective, very anti-inflammatory. And then whey protein from dairy also can help to support gut health. And then intermittent fasting, we talked about that. This is a lot of data now being looked at intermittent fasting for cancer, for heart disease, for dementia, reversal of cognitive decline using Fasting. Fasting is a time when, again, the gut helps to repair itself, and it may be the way that we reduce inflammation in the gut. Then moderate exercise and sleep and stress management. So how do you know you have a healthy gut? You look at your poop. <laughs> Can you see type 3 and type 4? We all, type 4 is the happiest face, right? <laughs> type 3 is pretty good, pretty good. But if you're type 1 or 2, you need more prebiotics and probiotics and water and all that stuff. And if you're over here type five, six, seven, it means there's a little distrust going on there also. So however your poop looks is an indication of how healthy you are. <laughs> and then rebalance. So what do we need to rebalance to support restorative processes? Like getting a good night's sleep. The immune system repairs itself at night. Doing things that help us to lower stress during the day. And there's lots of things that we can do. We can eat mindfully, we can meditate or pray, like Susie said. Um, you know, connecting with something bigger than yourself can be very powerful. Massage, time spent in nature, pets, sleep, exercise, journaling is a great way to reduce stress when you just write out whatever is in your head and then you rip it, shred it, throw it away because you don't want anyone to see it, but it's a great way to get your stress out on paper. <laughs> Laughter. 
and then cultivating a sense of awe and gratitude for your life. And um, how many of you are familiar with the UC Berkeley, the Greater Good Science Center? Anybody here? It's a wonderful, you should look them up online, Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. They're doing a one-day conference in June only on the cultivation of awe and the impact that that has on our physical and our mental well-being. It's really fascinating. So when people are out in nature, how many of you, you've been out in nature and you've seen a sunrise or a sunset that moved you? How many of you? Yeah. So if, even if you feel like, you know, I don't have a personal spirituality or I don't go to church, a lot of people feel that when they're outside in nature. How do you cultivate that? It may be a piece of music you listen to that moves you or um, it's, it's um, being with, uh, you know, with animals. What, whatever it is for you, cultivating that sense of awe is really good for your health. So putting it all together, you want to feed your microbiome, you want to eat those healthy foods. It's more important than ever. We need to support our local farmers. Um, I'm on the board for Soil Born Farms. The founders and directors are here tonight. It's an amazing organization that really tries to not only grow healthy organic food, but educate the public. Look that up online, Soil Born Farms. I'd love to see you there. Um, so, you know, you support your farmer's markets. Um, avoid sugars and flours and other processed foods. Even whole wheat flour, whole grain flours are not necessarily good for the gut. We should be eating the whole grains, the whole cooked grains. Avoid animal foods that have been raised with antibiotics, if you can. And that's, there's a lot more available now. Watching your artificial sweeteners. You're better off having the sugar, I think, than eating artificial sweeteners. Watch your pesticides. Avoid antibiotics where you can. Watch those acid-blocking drugs. Don't use antibacterial soaps. You don't need them. Just use regular soap. Cultivate resilience and gratitude and awe in your life. And hang out at a farm. Enjoy your pets. Put your hands in the soil, and that's my dog. So <laughs> she makes me smile, makes me laugh. So anyway, um, I probably went over time. Thank you so much for being here. This is just to give you a little bit of intro about the gut and the microbiome and why we think this is so important. And now Akil and Diane are going to take over and expand this even more. So I hope it's an informative and wonderful evening for you, and thank you for your support.